The deadline for DACA quickly approaching. This is so important because this is about the next two years of your life. The Mexican government working to support the needs of students and young workers. I'm just here working, trying to make a life for myself. Plus a legal analysis of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. This is Arizona Week. Hello and thanks for joining us. The deadline for DACA recipients to apply for renewal is three weeks on October 5th. That's the last day the government will accept applications for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. It's a hot button issue that came to a head this week. A protest in New York City outside of Trump Tower. Three congressional representatives, including Representative Raul Grijalva, reportedly blocked traffic and refused to leave. Police arrested all three. On his Facebook page, the congressman said he was proud to have been arrested while standing up for what he says is right. Also this week, the Mexican consulate in Tucson hosting a workshop for DACA recipients, providing one-on-one -on -one consultations with immigration attorneys and offering information about resources in Mexico. I spoke with Ricardo Pineda, the Mexican consulate, at this week's event. So tell us about this event today. Why start this? Well, we, we opened since the very beginning, no? We have different programs at the consulate in order to assist the community. When we know about this uh, regrettable uh, happening, about the resigning of DACA program, we decide to open, not only on weekdays, but also every weekend. So we are here to help the community, and we are going to do every effort to provide service to, to them, especially the so-called dreamers. What, uh, what does the Mexican government want these DACA recipients to know about what's available to them should they end up back in Mexico? That our government and us are with them, that don't hesitate to contact us. We think that is the most valuable people for our country. If they decide to go back to Mexico, we're fully prepared to receive them. But we know that they have a growth here, they have interest in being over here, they have studied here, they have their families here, so we are here to help them. So we are, uh, we do respect to the U.S. sovereignty, not because the U.S. government is, uh, is uh, the, uh, sovereign in order to decide the best way to apply the migratory policies. We fully respect that. We want to help in any possible way, with the help of attorneys, with the help of every way or means that Mexico's government has, now which is through us uh, giving them consular assistance. We are fully prepared for that. Should these DACA recipients end up back in Mexico, what sort, what sort of life or resources await them? We have put a number of resources, not only job offerings, but the possibility to, for them to be immediately included in the education system. No, and also, we are here in Mexico to receive them. If they decide to go, well, we know that they are educated, they speak English, they speak Spanish, they can be fully incorporated to the economic life in our country. For us, it's part of the most valuable treasure. They are young people, fully educated, that for sure are going to uh, contribute to our economy and society, same as they have been doing here in the U.S. There were economic challenges in Mexico that probably brought a lot of these families here in the first place. How do you assure them that some of that has stabilized, that it's different now, that it can help them? We, every year, we uh, are creating different job offerings in Mexico. Uh, we are pretty confident with education. They are going to take advantage, good advantage on that. And they are going to be uh, fully competent in order to be incorporated to the uh, public uh, life and to the economy of our uh, country. What are some of the things that you hope people understand as they watch this situation continue to unfold? President Trump is having conversations with the Democrats. The immigration is at the forefront. But a lot of us are watching, and we don't know what to make of this. We are fully confident also that uh, the legislative power in the U.S. is finally going to give a, a definite solution to this uh, predicament. We know that uh, so far there are a number of conversations and the deadline is, is in the coming six months, so we think that is enough time. We're pretty confident that everything is going to happen for the good sake of our community and for these young Mexican people. In the meantime, it has created some uncertainty for these families. DACA recipients have little brothers and sisters who are U.S. citizens. Mom and dad have mixed status. Emotionally, it's taking a toll. Do you see that? We see that. Now, we are fully concerned because of these happenings. That is why 
uh, the Mexican consular network, which includes 50 consulates in the U.S. plus the Mexican embassy, is working and doing everything in our hand in order to get together to the people, outreach them and tell them, telling them, don't hesitate, call the consulate, come over here, we are going to provide every assistance we have in hand, including professional counseling or even financial help in order to uh, help them to uh, really uh, get a solution on this specific predicament. Okay, Mr. Pineda, thank you so much. No, thank you. Events like this one have taken place every weekend since the Trump administration announced it would begin rescinding deferred action for childhood arrivals. From workshops to forums, this event has provided an avenue of support for DACA recipients, among them Pedro Castro. He's lived in the U.S. since the age of one. So how old are you? I'm 23. 23. Why are you here at the consulate's office today? Um, to get help to renew my papers. How complicated is this process? At first it was very complicated because we didn't know how we were going to get the money. And I came to the Mexican consul, asked for help, and in a couple of weeks I got a money order and I was able to send it. So, as I understand it here, the Mexican consulate is giving you information about if you should end up in Mexico, about working and school. Does any of that help you feel better? No, because I don't know. I'm not even a citizen over there, I think. I'm not sure. I have the birth certificate and everything from there, but I, I don't know. I saw you working with the attorney today. She's sort of preparing you for what could happen in the event of you also going back to Mexico. Yeah. Do you think about that? All the time. See what would happen if I go back. Because I don't know nothing over, that's over there. I don't even know my hometown. So you said you were born in Caranea, yeah. brought to the U.S. when you were one, mm -hmm. but you've not been back since. Okay. Been here my whole life. So how do you consider yourself? I mean, what, how would you describe yourself? Are you an American? I don't know. I don't even know if I'm Mexican. It's like both, I guess, but it's just complicated. I don't know. You're a high school graduate? Yeah. During this process, what is, what is the Mexican consulate telling you? Like, what are you entitled to? What are your rights? Um, I haven't came in a long time, so I don't know what any of my rights are. I know that I have rights and I'm protected and all that, but if I don't have my card on me, like, and I get pulled over and they ask for it, I don't know what could happen. How has your life changed in the last two weeks since President Trump made the announcement? Uh, very nervous, couldn't sleep at night, couldn't eat at some point. It was, it was scary. And you explained that your personal situation, mom and dad, well, your dad has a... Um, uh, he has a Mika for okay. one year and then he has to renew it. Okay, so that's a work visa? Yeah, basically. Okay, and your mom is not documented? No, she's not. And then you have little brothers and sisters? Yes. Who are U.S. citizens? Yep. Have they all talked about how your life changes? If Yeah, they have. They were scared, too. They were, what, what's going to happen if you go back to Mexico? And I was like, I don't know. So you're a graduate of a local high school here in Tucson? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said earlier that you're not sure that you're American or that you're Mexican. Yeah. So what do you tell people if they were to ask you? Well, I just um, I guess Mexican. Mm -hmm. But I talk more English than Spanish, mm -hmm. so yeah. And your work life? I mean, you get up and go to work like everybody else? Yeah, in the mornings, 7.30, out the door, mm -hmm. get to work by 8, see if the trucks are loaded, and take off to Nogales, Arizona. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Pass through the checkpoint every day. What do you say when you go through a checkpoint? Um, well, they haven't stopped us recently, but they ask a uh, U.S. citizen, and I say no, and then they ask me, what do you have, and I give them my card. And then they just tell me, oh, it expires soon. I'm like, yeah, I know. And I just, they let us go. What card is it that you have? The DACA. You said you're 23? Yeah, 23. And you, don't, you do not go to school? No, not yet. Why not? Um, I don't know if I qualify for financial aid. I think I do. I'm not sure. I have to investigate more on that. What kind of education are you interested in? Are you interested uh, in any career? Being a police officer. A police officer? Okay, wonderful. There are people who have been watching this DACA conversation unfold, and they don't necessarily always support the DACA recipients, or they question what your parents decided to do in all these years that have gone by. What don't those people know about people like you? Um, you always have to watch your back. You can't really trust a lot of people because 
if somebody gets in trouble and you're with them, you go down too. And it's worse for you because you don't know if they could take away your papers. When I didn't have my papers, I, I, like my dad told me when I was in middle school, you know that you don't have papers, right? And I was like, yeah. And then, then I always had to watch my back and see the crowd that I was with, make smart choices. For people who think that you should not be here or that you should go back to Mexico, your country where you were born, what do you say to them? I'm just here working, trying to make a life for myself, have a future here. Because I don't, I don't know my homeland. What, I don't know what I would do over there. Do you feel like you've embraced America since you've been here? Yeah, you could say that. I, I like it here. Would I go back to Mexico? I'll go and visit, but I wouldn't go back to live. Why not? I, I don't know. I just, it doesn't feel right living over there. The cost for a DACA application is nearly $500. That's not including other legal fees like paying for a lawyer. The immigration attorneys volunteering at the Mexican consulate office say they are helping DACA recipients process paperwork and understand the legal ramifications of the program. The reason an event like this is so important is because we're coming up against a very hard deadline, which is the 5th of October. And people have until that day to submit the renewal for their DACA, um, their deferred action and their work permits. And if no one sends that by that date, if anyone sends it by the 6th of October, it's too late. They cannot renew. Too late, and then what? how does their status change? Um, when their card expires, which presumably would be expiring between September and March of next year, that would be it. They could not extend that permission anymore. You've been really busy today. You've had other workshops like this. What sorts of questions are you fielding right now? Um, right now, people want to know what's next. People want to know what's going to happen to them. And they ask me about what the president's going to do or not do. And I have to kind of give them a, a quick history lesson and say, well, you know, it depends on Congress. Uh, Congress has the power to, to legislate, uh, to write the laws. And I explain what could happen and what couldn't happen right now. I'm not so focused on what's going to happen in the future because the priority right now is to renew for those who can. What are their rights at this point? This really, it's kind of a gray area until March. So if you're a DACA recipient and you have filled out your form, what are, you, what are your rights up until March? If you have a work permit and it expires, let's, let's say next February, you can work up until the date on your card. So that, that's one right that you, that you do have. If you were given a work permit, work permission, and it expires on a certain date, you can work up until that date, and you shouldn't be afraid of working or, or driving until that, the expiration date. Some of the DACA recipients I've spoken with have little brothers and sisters who are U.S. citizens. Mom and dad have a mixed status. Maybe one has a visa, one does not. Yes. How are those families sort of processing this unknown right now? It's mixed. Uh, a lot of people are very scared. Um, and there's so much misinformation going on that people don't know what to do. And that's why uh, the Mexican consulate is spreading the word saying, this is not over. We have to do what's first, first and foremost, renew for those who can. Second of all, make sure that we provide uh, legal advice for people who have questions about their status or what's going to happen in their future. And that's what we're here for, too, be able to provide that advice and see if there's any other forms of relief for people. Okay. Um, for those who are watching this, there are DACA recipients who are going to say, the president made his announcement, I'm not giving the government any more money or information. You are telling them they should. The government already has their information. You're, you're not really losing much, uh, but you have a lot to gain. You have two more years to gain uh, in legal status, and that is priceless. Uh, it's worth it to do it. Um, you can't apply for the first time anymore, so those people who are afraid of the government having their information, who didn't have it before, they can rest assured because they, don't, they can't apply. So everybody who's applying right now for renewal, they already know where you're at, and if they would have come to get you, they would have already done so. And if you're, if you're clean, if you don't have any, any arrests or any criminal convictions, you can rest assured for now. Uh, and also, one of the things that we're telling people is stay informed and stay prepared.
Okay. Um, in the days following the Trump administration's announcements, there have been rallies, there have been gatherings, and some of these DACA recipients are being pretty are being hit pretty hard by people who don't agree with what's taking place. They question which country they really belong to. What do people need to know about these DACA recipients? I think one of the things that people who don't have DACA need to know is that DACA is not citizenship. DACA is a band-aid. It's something to protect people who came here when they were little. They didn't come here on purpose. They didn't break the law on purpose. They came here with their family, to be with their family. And also, uh, a lot of people, I've seen a lot of things where people uh, say, oh, this is just a cheat to get your citizenship. You're going to get your citizenship. Well, no, not really. This is just deferred action. Get informed. If you, if you were against it, get informed as to what the program really is. Um, and if you are if you're a DACA recipient and you're, you're angry and upset and you want to voice your opinion, that's protected. You have, you have that right to criticize the government and to say, hey, I want to, I want to speak and say that I want, I want this for me because people are doing this because this is their country, because they don't want to leave because this is what they know. They're, they don't remember Mexico. They don't remember other countries. All they know is where they've been living since they were little. Um, and I think most of why people are protesting is because they love this country and they don't want to leave. For example, I did ask Pedro, the student that you worked with today, asked him how he identifies himself and he couldn't answer if he's American or Mexican. How do you view these clients? I think in their heart, they're Americans. In their heart, they, they, they love where they're at and they, they have respect for the country where they came from because they were born there but they identify with the country that took them in. Um, one of the arguments that I've seen is at these rallies, we have DACA recipients who have Mexican flags or other Mexican insignia that, that makes some folks uncomfortable because they think, are you here as an American? Does that make you uneasy to hear that argument? I think it's, it also comes from a place of misinformation. I think um, people who have DACA and rightly so, like for example, Pedro, who said, well, I, I can't say I'm American because I'm not allowed to say I'm an American. And I'm kind of a Mexican because I was born in Mexico, but I'm not really a Mexican Mexican who grew up there. There's, there's a lot of confusion, but they love their mother country. Um, they also love this country. So you will see Mexican flags. You'll see the Vir Virgin of Guadalupe. You will see American flags. And I think if, if you want, if you're looking for something, you're going to find it, right? And if you're looking only for Mexican flags, you're going to find them. If you're going to look for the one or two people that are causing you havoc, you're going to find them. But also remember that everybody who wants to protest, they're just wanting to voice out their opinion. And they want to be heard. And they want to tell the president and everyone else, hey, we're here. We want to stay here. And even in your opinion, as non-US citizens, they have that right. Everybody who's here in this country is protected by the Constitution of the United States. As the October deadline approaches and as questions arise, a variety of groups and leaders are hosting forums about the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. On Saturday, Congressman Raul Grijalva will return to Southern Arizona for a Know Your Rights Forum. It's scheduled for Saturday, September 23rd at his Tucson office from 1 to 2.30. The congressman will be joined by immigration and legal experts. Then Monday, the University of Arizona College of Social and Behavioral Sciences and the U of A James E. Rogers College of Law will host a panel discussion Q&A. This one's scheduled for Monday, September 25th, beginning at 5.30 in Gallagher Theater at the Student Union Memorial Center on the U of A campus. Among those on the panel, DACA recipients. There will also be free legal consultations after the event. For a deeper analysis into the legalese of DACA and what's to come, I'm joined by Lynn Marcus, co-director of the Immigration Law Clinic here at the University of Arizona. Lynn, thanks so much for being here. You're welcome. Let's begin with some of what I've heard, that DACA was not constitutional to begin with. Was it or is it? Well, the argument that it, that it isn't is that um, the president has to execute the laws that Congress passed. But the argument that it is is that when you have 11 million undocumented people in the country, like any law enforcement agency, you have to set law enforcement priorities. And it's within the discretion of any law enforcement agency to set those priorities. In fact, the president has to. And that doing so in a blanket way 
with a discrete group of people who have been well vetted is within the president's constitutional authority. Okay, and with regard to constitutionality, we've heard there's already litigation involved. There have lawsuits that have been filed in nearly 20 states, if not more by this point. Where will we see those cases go? Will they end up in court? I mean, those cases are in court as of the, as of the day that Jeff Sessions announced the rescission of DACA. And um, there are some interesting legal arguments. I mean, one, of the, one of the arguments is similar to that that succeeded in many cases against the president's travel ban, which is that it was his decision to rescind was based on racial animus, in that case, religious animus, in this case, the accusation is anti-Hispanic and anti-Mexican animus and that constitutionally the president cannot act based on such animus. So that's one of the arguments that's being made. And these various arguments being made are being made by heavy hitters in the legal community um, in various parts of the country. So I don't know what will happen. They may seek injunctions against the rescission, which means that it would, that DACA would, you know, that the rescission would not go forward. A lot of the DACA recipients I have spoken to have expressed concern about being in a legal gray area. They're not certain of what happens once this renewal ends or if Congress hasn't made any sort of decision about their future. Are they in a gray area and what are their rights? Well, I mean, there's two gray areas there. One gray area is what are their rights right now for the, as, they, as they still have DACA and until their cards, their work authorization cards run out. And I agree that that's a gray area because U.S. Citizen and Immigration Services on its website says that they continue to have deferred action, which means that their deportation and action against them is deferred um, and work authorization until their cards expire. But Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is also under Department of Homeland Security, has said in several cases that DACA deferred action has been rescission even rescinded even if the work authorization the right you know continues and so um, that's a scary situation right now I mean, DACA has always been discretionary and it could be taken away it could be revoked um, but but to say that that there's no more deferred action as of today um, in, in one place of the agency that enforces the law that's that's disturbing but in terms of the longer picture when the cards do expire the question is is Congress going to pass replacement legislation. And there has been dreamer, what they call dreamer legislation since 2001. And there've been times when Congress has been on the brink of passing it. And right now there's a gun to Congress's head because DACA will start expiring. The DACA cards will start expiring as of March 6th. But these students, that they can be arrested then? Is that what you're, under, what are their rights? I mean, could they be arrested at that point? Well, um, I mean, definitely after. I mean, def right now, ICE has arrested some DACA people if they, for example, um, have some reason to do so, like the person was charged with a misdemeanor offense or something, um, even if their DACA has not been officially rescinded. But as the cards begin to expire, um, people will still have constitutional rights. Anyone in this country has constitutional rights, and that includes the right to due process, not to be stopped while walking or driving based on race, not to have uh, law enforcement burst into their house unless they authorize it or, or unless there's a valid warrant. Um, and other rights under the Constitution, such as not to incriminate yourself, not to, not to be forced to answer questions that are incriminating, such as what country are you from or whether you have status in this country. And that's regardless of citizenship. Everyone is entitled to that. Everyone has the right to due process, and, and people with DACA especially have to get informed of their rights because they are so integrated into our society, and, and uh, you know, by definition, they're not criminals, and so they're used to cooperating with law enforcement, and they may need to consider when do they provide information and when do they, when do they not. But also, if people are put into removal proceedings, if they're caught up in a, in a raid that we've heard that, that raids are coming, um, people if they have not been deported before, they have the right to a hearing in front of an immigration judge to be released on their own recognizance or on a bond and request you know, for a bond to be released. And in some cases, they'll have defenses um, based on you know, acts that Congress has passed long ago. So I think it's, 
I know that it's very important that people with DACA seek consultations with reputable agencies and lawyers to get informed about what, what defenses would they have and are there immigration benefits that they might be eligible for right now. Okay. Some of these processes can take 10 years, Lorraine, so people might want to get those, people should get those going if they're eligible for other programs. Okay, I know you can't see into the future. Congress has its own calendar, but what is likely to happen or what can we expect over the next few months? The president has talked about um, an agreement or endorsing legislation for the DREAM Act if it is loaded up with res immigration restriction provisions. Um, and of course, that's of great concern. Um, you know, the DREAMers as an activist group, and there's a whole diversity of group, but don't want to be selling other immigrants down the river. Um, and so it's, it's not clear that there will be a, a consensus for DACA legislation. And uh, of course, the DREAMers themselves support um, standalone DACA legislation. And of course, many support more comprehensive legislation that would also legalize their parents and other people who have been in this country for so many years. But no one can say you know, what legislation might be able to get through, particularly given other priorities that Congress has right now. Okay, but it could send people back into the shadows. People risk, there is a great, a tremendous risk of people who have come out of the shadows and, and gotten legal employment and driver's licenses and bank accounts and bought their first car and bought their first house, now having to, now having to go revert to a status where, you know, they're always in fear and, you know, where they have no legal status in this country. And frankly, that's a national tragedy on a humanitarian level and as has been well documented on an economic level. So all around, it's, it would be a tragedy if that, if that happens. Okay, Lynn, thank you so much. There are about 800,000 DACA recipients currently enrolled in the program. It's likely that number could climb by October 5th. Here in Tucson, the Mexican consulate office houses the call center for all questions related to issues like DACA. This is the Center for Information and Assistance to Mexicans. The consulate says operators are fielding calls 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Callers are able to get help with everything from what is needed should they return to Mexico, legal advice, and help processing paperwork. We are the so-called Center for Information and Assistance to Mexicans, the so-called CM. Call us, we are in the internet, we are in social media. You can outreach us any possible way you wish. There are about 40 operators available at the center. Last year, the Mexican consulate says the office recorded about 140,000 phone calls. And that's our program. Thanks so much for joining us.